Yes, the matter of Pistorius. Please, the court knights, spelled K-H-H-T, initials SD, legal officer instructed by the officer director of public prosecutions, are here for the respondent. Yes, thank you, Mr Knight. Ms Pistorius, you appear for yourself today? Yes, Judge. Yes. Now, this is your application for variation of your bail. That's right, Judge. I have... A copy of your application for the variation, and I also have a copy of an affidavit, which is is a combination of submissions as well as producing other material that you rely on. Is that your material, Ms. Pistorius? Yes, I put that um, bundle together. Yes. With the submission at the front about my reasoning. Um, so the first document is my reasoning and the other documents are the references that go with the re reasoning that are, re that are referred yeah. to in the reasoning. So it is... <clears throat> your, your affidavit of 20 March 2024, which has exhibited to it... Uh, exhibits A through the K. That's right. So there's no um, number eight. There's no judgment for Brown versus Tasmania in there. I see. All right. Yes, I have that material. Mr. Knight. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, I seek Your Honour's leave to read and file the Crown's material, consisting of a written outline of submissions of the respondent dated 25 March 2024. An affidavit under the hand of Joshua Sarn, affirmed on 25 March 2024. Now, Mr. Pistorius, have you seen and do you have copies of those? The no. outline of submissions for the respondent? No, Judge. And an affidavit, both 25 March. Tonight, both you know, been provided. I, I had uh, sent the material to uh, the applicant's email address that was on her uh, address for service, and I sent that uh, sent that last night at oh, sorry, but yesterday afternoon at four or three p.m. Uh, but I can certainly provide um, the applicant with copies of that material. Mr. Stories. The, well, I'm told it's been emailed, but do you have hard copies there, Mr. Knight? Ms. Pistorius, it's perhaps best if you have the opportunity to read the material, at least the outline of submissions, to see what the Crown's arguments are. It's, it's okay, Judge, I can see what it is quite quickly. Yes. And I, I don't think it really, um, I don't think there's anything in there that I don't fully understand or um, I've read all the court briefs before. Yes. I understand what the counter-terrorism police are trying to do. And that's why I've brought this submission. So I don't think there's anything there that's, um, you know, that I won't have already addressed in my submission. All right. Well, it's it's really the the submissions that are made at the end of the outline of submissions from paragraphs 19 to 23. It's really those matters that are the focus of the Crown's case.
Yes, I think, um, yes, that's sort of what I'm addressing. I, I, I also make those points, yes. um, but I go further to argue... Um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. No, Ms. Um, Pistorius, that's all right. I, I, um, go f I just go forward to argue some other sort of more general points which I would like an opportunity to put forward. The yes, you, you'll have the in opportunity. Case I want to, um, yeah. At the moment, the, all I'm doing at the moment, Ms. Pistorius, is just identifying the material that's relied upon by each of the parties sure. for the application. Yep. Um, and I, as I've said, I'll give you the opportunity if you wish to read any of that further if you need the time. Well, also, you may need the time to read my submission. Well, I've received all of your material in advance administratively because it had been filed, so I've, I've had the chance to read oh, over you. your material, but I will hear further from you, and yep. you can take me directly to relevant parts that you wish to emphasise. Thank you. But Thank you. I'll give the Crown leave to read and file the outline submissions and the affidavit of Joshua Sam, sworn 25 March 2024. Who's Joshua Sam? That's the affidavit, the person who's sworn the affidavit for the Crown. So the larger document. Who are they? That's an officer within the, an employee in the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions. Oh, okay. Um, I just grabbed my... Um, yes. My highlighter, because I understand that it's important to... So, Ms. Pistorius, it's... It's your application to vary the condition in respect of non-attendance at those identified locations at the, the Boeing Defence Office in the Ferry Group building. That's right. <clears throat> now, as I said, I have I have read your application and your submissions and supporting documents. The supporting documents I have I have perused, but I haven't gone into them in detail beyond what's necessary to understand your submissions. Mm. But I understand the basis of your submissions. But it's your opportunity now to make any oral submissions that you want to me to support your application for the variation. Um, the, in terms of the the issue before me, though, <clears throat> this is not a question of of me considering whether you should be granted bail. You've already been granted bail. It's simply a question of whether I should allow your application to vary and delete that condition. So the the issue is whether I'm satisfied that that condition is more onerous than is necessary. So that's really the test that I'm looking at today. Mm. Yes, and uh, we go to this idea of necessary and what necessary means, because um, I would say that necessary is a very vague term and does not, and is very rarely applied to protesters. Um, and there's a number of vague terms in the bail law that doesn't, that don't, necessarily apply to or take into account the implied freedom of communication. So um, what I'm the reason I'm opposing the variation is that I don't think I should have any bail conditions um, and that the application of bail is being misused not by the courts but as a police tactic to contain our behaviour as protesters. And, um, and therefore I think that bail law should be framed through the complex questions of proportionality related to the implied freedom of communication um, when there's a political issue and that the Bail Act should not be being used to deter or control protesters' activities when we're talking about 
what is ultimately peaceful assemblies or non-violent well, action. That the, the issue is, though, that the condition has been imposed by the court. Yes. By the magistrate's court. And I think you made an application previously for a variation in the magistrate's court, didn't you? I didn't get to apply my arguments because mag I, I, I did a variation. Magistrate Merrin yes. would not hear my arguments on the basis that they didn't think I met some threshold in the magistrate's court for, and, and they were un, unwilling to undermine their colleague, uh, Magistrate Power, who had seen me when I was in the watch house, and who did give very, um, a minimal bail conditions. I admit they're minimal bail conditions, but I want to set out what I think the effect of those bail conditions are on a protester and on the protest and on the implied freedom of communication because I think at the moment uh, these matters, and this is why I want to put them into this court record, because I think these matters are being, um, are not well thought through and not well expressed in the court, uh, in either the court system or the policing, uh, um, the use of bail in the policing area. And well, I, I'm, this is not the only time I've been caught up in this situation and I, um, I'm aware of uh, incredibly onerous effects of bail, even when they're quite small conditions. Ms. Pistorius, the, the issue that you need to confront, though, is that the condition to not attend at those locations was imposed as part of the granting of bail for a particular reason, and that is to ensure that there would be no repetition or a, it wouldn't be an unacceptable risk of committing any offence. That's as I understand the basis for that condition being imposed in the first place. Now, it's, that's what you need to deal with. So it's not, this is not an application of, which is about any right that you have to engage in a peaceful protest or to undertake political activities or to communicate or freedom of communication about any of those issues which you're concerned about. It's, it's more narrow than that. It's looking at the question of whether the condition that's been imposed is sufficient and necessary. Well, I would say by narrowing it, you undermine the implied freedom of communication that is an implied right of all citizens and it is my duty to act in the world and that if I have no space in the court to bring that duty then I have no space in the court to bring that duty but that will in itself begin to undermine the system of law but and this, that I want to put stories. that through I've only done the introduction I haven't actually spoken to my my no, of course not, and I'm going to give you the opportunity at the moment. I'm just simply trying to direct you as to the matters that are of concern to me that you'll need to address in your submissions, and I'm trying to make it clear to you that it's that, that when I say narrow focus, I understand there's a lot of um, principles and points that you have that sit behind that, but ultimately what I need to hear is you to address the question of why it's not sufficient and necessary condition that you not attend those locations in order to ensure that you're not at unacceptable risk of committing further offences because that's that's the basis on which the condition was imposed so it's not a condition which is one that's stopping you from exercising any implied freedom of communication or engaging in peaceful protests or political activities it's but, it put, is. but it's been put there for a reason, and the reason is it's alleged that you engaged in not only protest activities, but ultimately the commission of offences. So, and, and I'm sure you appreciate from the materials that you've provided the distinction between peaceful protests, which are lawful and part of our democratic system that anyone has the right to engage in, and when it gets to the point of engaging in unlawful activities, which, okay, well are not, then, which are not part of 
part of any expression of communication or freedom. I will then draw your attention, Your Honour, to tab nine yes. and the general comment of, um, we can start there if that's the place you'd like to start. Just, and I would uh, say just one moment, just... Tab nine and uh, it's the expression in the, in the submission, is it number seven in the submission? Is this... Which document is it? Uh, tab nine is the general comment number 37 on the right to peaceful assembly. International covenant of civil and political rights is a very rich document. It's quite a new document. It will never have been in front of this court before. Certainly not in front of the um, uh, counter-terrorism police who arrested me in my bed at night at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and I'm just, I'm just putting that out because we're in a, a context of overreach. I'm here because we're in a context of extreme overreach. And I'm not here just because nothing happened to me, but because I can see that the police are strongly attempting to deter me and others from communicating about issues that are very important. Well, at the moment, it's not, it's not about the police, it's about the condition the court's imposed. I know, but the material on which the court is using is police descriptions of my behaviour. And then what you need to do is to take them to that and to any material that well, you will, so... Well, I will take your, I will take your just attention. Just one moment, Mr Stewart. Take me to that and take me to whatever other material or submissions that you have about that, which you say That's demonstrates that there's no foundation for the condition. All right, let's start with tab nine. Yes. With the general comment 37 and some definitions of so-called violence. Because the Queensland paragraph thirty-seven. Yep. No, no. It's um, it's called the general comment number thirty-seven because it's a comment that's made about the meetings that are given to oh, the yes, international see. current civil political rights. Yes. Um, no, Article twenty-one. Okay, what, so, what part of that document? All right. So uh, I I point any like you could pick any paragraph, but I have picked ten or so paragraphs that are yes. in section seven. So we can start with. Paragraph one, the yes. critical role uh, that peaceful assembly plays as an expression of, um, of communication. So that's the first one. Yes. Paragraph 15 pref uh, refers directly to what you just commented upon, which is sort of definition of violence. Yes. And what we see and, what, and sort of what peaceful is in relationship to violence. Um, and that that in it gives a very explicit definition in the negative. Uh, it says that violence, uh, in the context of Article Twenty One, uh, typically entails the use of participants of physical force against others that is likely to result in injury or death or serious damage to property. Mere pushing and shoving or disruption of vehicle vehicular or pedestrian movement or daily activities do not amount to violence. So that's, that's one um, very explicit paragraph that sheds light on the definition of violence and peaceful assemblies in related to, to violence. Yeah. Okay, that, I, I'll come back to my... Well, I'll just refer directly to the allegations of the context of what... Um, Gilchrist, Senior Constable Gilchrist, in his affidavit that's at number two, um, and also that the um, <coughs> that the DPP have put in their affidavit, you can see at number twenty-two. No, at number uh, twenty. Is this in the DPP? Yeah, the DPP they put a nice sort of summary in there, saying, and it's also in uh, in Gilchrist's affidavit, the original bail affidavit that while Gilchrist has described incident after incident of pushing and shoving as extreme violence and escalating violence, that I did not do, by the way, um, if, it, if it occurred at all, uh, 
or just to put that on the record, um, that I, uh, it's, it is not submitted at number at paragraph 20 of the DPP's submission. Yeah. It is not submitted that the applicant personally committed any property damage or violence, uh, with the exception of the alleged common assault at the Boeing incident. And the common assault at the Boeing incident was 10 people moving through a doorway um, at the same, at a very close proximity. And the person who was trying to hold the door closed, um, being moved out of the way by those 10 people moving through the doorway, of which I was one, and which the police uh, manoeuvred their statement to make me the one who had harmed this, who had assaulted, which was moving through the doorway. Um, they had made this statement uh, that I had, it's in the original affidavit at tab two, no, at tab um, three, that I had shoved my shoulder into her chest as it went past. And I would say that this was a manufactured description of violence that was made in order to hold me in the watch house, pick me up in the morning um, and um, enable my non-participation in an ordinary peaceful assembly the next day. And they say that also in the affidavit. They say in the affidavit at, um, number, at number three, I'm sorry, yeah, at number three. Yes. Um, the, uh, again, they say in this, that first big paragraph, the top, page three of nine, whilst yes. the defendant does not have any significant criminal history, um, she may emboldened others to commit more violent acts. So they start to build a picture of me as someone who is somebody I, who's got 30 years of non-violent, explicit non-violent action under my belt. Um, they start to treat me as if I'm somebody who is somehow encouraging other people to violence. Um, and then they say it's appropriate the defendant remains in custody until she complies with the direction to provide her access information. So they make an argument that I should be held indefinitely until I provide a PIN number. And then... Where, where is that, Mr. Uh, Stories? That's the next paragraph, the last line. For this reason alone, I respectfully propose that it is appropriate that I, that the defendant, that's me, remains in custody until she complies with the direction. Um, and then we have... Um, at the bottom, they say, they start to, again, they speak very sort of expansively about this expected violence, um, which never occurred, by the way. I suspect that if the defendant is granted bail and attends the planned protest the next day, she will not only subject herself to increased risk of physical harm, which I have never received except from the police in the watch house, but she may also be part of escalating tensions that result in further members of Pharaoh being assaulted. So again, they're making an idea that somehow I have control over a, of ordinary other protesters and that I am um, some sort of person who is going to go and whip them into a frenzy. Um, and that the whole this, this whole affidavit, uh, that was the original bail affidavit, has these... Um, uh, hyperbole, violence hyperbole, okay? But if we go back to um, tab nine and look at the general comment, there's a number of reasons why that sort of violence hyperbole, where they're talking about what other people do, what other people did, what I might do in the future, but actually has no bearing on what I actually did, um, is used to, um, uh, to argue for, for, for these bail conditions that I think are unfair and unnecessary. And I'll talk a bit a little bit later about what the risks of those bail conditions are, are for me. So it's not, those risks are not just about not attending those sites and attending those protests, but those risks are about being picked up in the prelude to other actions, which is what we're seeing through police actions, that bail conditions are being used to uh, pick people up and truncate their liberation. Uh, their liber what it's called, um, their liberty, to truncate their liberty in order to control them at future moments in time, um, and we've seen this. Mr. Pistorius, the right, so part of the reason why bail conditions are imposed 
well, the reason bail conditions are imposed are to ensure that a person who's released on bail does not present as an unacceptable risk. So under the Bail Act, if a person is an unacceptable risk or amongst other things committing a further offence, if released on bail, then the court would refuse to grant bail. But as part of making that determination, the court must consider whether there are conditions which might be proposed which would ameliorate that risk to an acceptable level. Here, that's one of the conditions or the condition that was considered necessary to ameliorate the risk that you might commit a further offence True. On bail. So that's that's, that's, that's the true. point. That's true, but I would yeah. say that that is entirely contested. That view of bail that I have read on the but civil what, liberties. What, what part is contested? That bail is for to stop people from committing future offences. Bail is. It's not about to... stopping, but that's the bail act. That's what the law states: is that the court who grants bail must consider. I think this person's an unacceptable risk, and if if the court does conclude that, then bail would not be granted. If that's the way the court is going, that is a complete and uh, not how bail is supposed to be. If you look at the Ms. bail, Pistorius, that's the bail act. That's the law. I'm still going like to. I'm still going to. Well, then you'll have to have a discussion with the Civil Liberties Council. Of I Queensland. don't need to have a discussion because on their... this is your application. You need to convince me. Yeah. Well, that I'm the just condition gonna... that we that you are seeking to have varied is not sufficient and necessary. Well, you might as well lock up everyone. I thought that we had the law to stop people from that's from not, breaking the law. That's not helpful in any way for the your application. I'm not dealing with every other person. I'm dealing with you, you and your application. Right, well, as I said, it's, it's fairly confined to whether that condition is sufficient and necessary. Well, I'm going to put on... The, I don't know if this has been uh, challenged at a, another level, but I'm going to put on the record that if that is the purpose of the Bail Act, is to stop future people, people offending in the future. That's the sole reason of the Bail Act. I understood that the Bail Act was to ensure people came back to court and to protect the integrity of the court case and that that included that you should not harm other people involved in the court case and that you should not um, threaten witnesses or interfere with evidence. Yes. And that the Bail Act, and the Bail traditionally has been about that, but there's been a cultural shift away from that to the Bail Act to be used by police unfairly to control people and that this is a problem and needs to be addressed. If you think that that is the bail, what the Bail Act is for, then that needs to be tested at some other point because I would say that it's widely accepted um, in, the, in the community, maybe not here in the, in the Supreme Court, but in the community that bail is about the retur return to court and protecting the legal process and not about you have the whole law that's available for protecting the community. That's what the law is for, Ms. not Ms. the Storis, Bail Act. You, so if we, you, I was just going to put that on the record, that if the Bail Act is being used to protect the community generally from protesters, that is problematic and I would be looking to appeal that. Have you, have you looked at the Bail Act? I have, and have I found it a 16? shambles Have you read act. Section 16 of the Bail Act? Oh, I have, and it's a shambles of an act, I'll have to say. I've well, also, uh, again, that, that type of commentary, Ms Pistorius, it doesn't advance your application one iota. Well, you have a look well, at Section 16 of the Act. It sets out <clears throat> the circumstances in which the court would refuse to grant bail. And, and it sets out there the unacceptable risks. Yep. And, and one of them is to commit an offence. Yep. So if a person is considers an unacceptable risk of committing a further offence if granted bail, then the court shall refuse to grant bail. Well, these but these here conditions... you were granted bail because the court was satisfied that with that condition in place that you're seeking to have eliminated, these conditions that you would do not, not be an unacceptable risk. These conditions do not stop me from um, committing another offence in another place. No, of course they don't. And as you say, that's not the purpose of the Bail Act in any event. What these conditions do is stop me from protesting legally outside no, these no, no. places. They stop you from going within 50 metres of a location in which it's alleged that you committed offences. All right, so as let's have a look of, then as at part of the tab. protest. And as again, as I've said, Mr. Pistorius, the difference here is between, on the one hand, your lawful right to engage in protest, peaceful protest, in which there's no issue whatsoever, and on the other hand, What's alleged that you were involved in the commission of offences? Peaceful That's, protest is, often includes disruption in offences. But what I'm raising with you is that there is a distinction between 
engaging in activities or even civil disobedience and unlawful behaviour, criminal behaviour, True. which I've is been, what you're charged with. I've been charged with those. What yes. I'm suggesting is that the Bail Act is not supposed to further deter me and others from the... But it's, it's, it's not. Ms. Pistorius, you're, you're, I understand that you have particular issues with the Bail Act and the police well, behaviour and the police approach to this matter, but I, I keep bringing you back that you need to direct your submissions to why those conditions aren't, aren't sufficient and necessary, and that's, that's what I'm raising with you in different ways, is that it's been determined that that would be a condition that would be imposed to grant you bail because it would mitigate any risk of you committing further offences. So... I'm saying it's disproportional to what is going on here. So we, we have, on one hand, is an identified plausible genocide with that's being armed by actual companies in Brisbane sending actual instruments of weapons to that plausible genocide. And that plausible genocide creates a circumstance by which protest is an, a natural and important duty of the individual. Right, let me stop you there. There's no, there's no issue or dispute about that, that you have a right to protest if you consider that those are matters mm. that you think are of importance to show your personal disapproval of and, and personal protest or to engage with others or, in fact, even to encourage others to also look at the issue and consider the wider picture. There's no issue with any of those things. The, the, the point, though, is you're not being charged with any activity of engaging in a protest. You're being, you've been charged with committing offences. I understand the way the police and the court think about it. I'm putting another view, which is that I think the implied freedom of communication requires an extraordinary proportionality. And I'd like to draw your attention to tab six, which is about location. And tab six is a, uh, you'll see a copy there of a judgment from 1994 about the, um, yes. the, and it's a very similar sort of situation to the Brown versus Tasmania case. Yes. But in this, it's specifically about the return of, uh, about the use of bail as a, a location based injunction. And in this, it was a Supreme Court case. 1994, I was in that courtroom and watched this case, but it's been used repeatedly in Victoria, but it hasn't made its way north. But it is, has um, an important sort of um, bearing on this sort of issue, on this issue, because what it says is... Um, in the third paragraph... I should allow the law to take its ordinary course and that it is not appropriate to seek to achieve by the application of the law relating to bail a collateral purpose, namely an injunction against the accused people that they not commit other offences. Uh, so I would say that there is case law from Mr Justice Byrne from 1994 regarding the use of injunction of bail as an injunction. Um, so that I just would like to put that forward. I would also continue to talk about uh, definitions of so-called violence at tab nine, um, and particularly the idea that individuals somehow are responsible for other individuals and they can be conflated into sort of one individual action when my actions are really... I've been singled out because I'm the oldest person with the longest and most known um, record, even though all of my... my whole offending history is completely non-violent. Um, and it is uh, extensive, and I'm proud of how extensive it is because I have stood against issues that have great meaning, have shown to be quite important and truthful. Um, and civil disobedience has an important role in the society, and we do end up in court, and we do take...
those judgments. And we do take that on our bodies when we do get found guilty. What I'm concerned about is the, the new use of bail, which is a new use, and every now and then it comes up and goes away, it comes up and goes away. And my concern is about the use of bail to contain protesters' activities. Um, and so just to referring by, by um, I'm just so, sorry, I'm just going to find the point in section six. Excuse me. In tab nine. You should, at paragraph 17, 19, where it's further explored that you must not take one person's behaviour with another. Um, also that paragraph 33, which outlines the importance of the right of participants to mobilise resources in the lead up to an action. Uh, paragraph 47 that reminds us that actions are necessarily disruptive well, and therefore will sometimes paragraph? 47 yes. paragraph 66 which suggests authorities can't require undertakings not to organize future assemblies which presumably also means not to be at future assemblies. Yes, it says or participate. Mm. Um, and there's this sort of idea that some comes and goes in the local sphere, depending on which police and what they put to map, you know, what they put out, is the idea that if you don't have a notification, if you haven't notified and got permission. Um, you've broken the law in some way, but this is simply not true. The Peaceful Assemblies Act is simply a notification regime. It's a regulatory notification regime and doesn't take the place of a permit regime. So to un undertake peaceful assemblies, we don't need to give or get permission. We can and we are invited to notify, but we are not required to notify. So well, there's, there's, and, no and issue, there's no issue about that. No, but it's it's part. I'm just putting it out on on the record because it's part of why the police um, say they act is that they say that we, you know, they can't control us. And that's some of the words they've used. Can't where where is that? Oh, it's actually in. Um, it was in another case in another place. So not this case. Not this case. Not this place. Right. It's it's. It's not um, helpful, Ms. Pistorius, to refer to other matters which don't relate to this particular case. So I really need your focus on why you say that this, uh, this variation should be granted because that condition is not one which is sufficient and necessary. All right, well then I will also take you to um The tab on that. Right, there's, just, there's a few. There's a few other elements. One, one which is not actually. Well, we. All right. So tab seven is a um, an e brief about Brown versus Tasmania that assisted me to uh, understand the outcomes of Brown versus Tasmania. Um, page six is the main page that is relevant. Um, page, page six. six. Got the page. Yes. Um, so what? What part of page six? Um, page six. Just let me find my notes. Uh, I think what's very important about this is a set of principles 
that can be drawn from the judgment. So uh, the, f the first is the very, it reasserts the importance of the implied freedom of communication in the, um, uh, in this case, in, in the design of law, but also obviously in the, um, in the operation of law. Um, and it's because it talks both about the design and the operation in the judgments. Um, so there's the idea that on-site protests are important. Um, Justice Gagler found that the uh, that on-site protests are important to draw attention to a political matter. Um, you can't you don't necessarily just do it in the abstract. That people often go to places to protest particular things that are occurring in those places. Um, thirdly, that the operation of the law should not act disproportionately as a deterrence uh, of freedom of communication to others. Um, and I would say the operation of this law is acting as a deterrence to others, that people are like uh, concerned about what they may and may not do. Um, but it's also a, a major deterrence to me because there's been three or four protests, uh, peaceful protests at both of those sites, uh, entirely non, with no arrests. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to point out there were no arrests at the two actions that I was at, that, that I wasn't arrested till the following week, uh, two weeks following one of them, when in a raid where they came to my house, even though they had my name and my address. So I wasn't arrested at either of the two actions. I was not seen to be as a, a, a problem um, until the counterterrorism squad became involved. Um, the operation of the fourth thing is, yes, yeah, so I do think that these, um, these bail operations are uh, act as deterrence. Uh, fourthly, and this is something which goes to the heart of liberty, is that there's criminal consequences flow from a perceived mistake in relationship to the um, to the bail to the operation of the bail. So if I'm what we've and I'm sorry to talk about something that's not in this case, but this is my um, lived experience um, that we're trying to get into articles, but they're no longer. But my lived experience is that um, activists are being picked up around the days just before a perceived mobilisation or a perceived peaceful assembly and put into jail and they use bail conditions as a pretext mm -hmm. for doing that. And the second way they, that they're doing it is they use um, activists who have, have been picked up uh, doing something fairly minor, uh, are kept in jail for up to you know, a week until they can get a bail hearing with a magistrate. Um, to allow them to be let go, and so they li so our liberty is at risk because even these tiny bail conditions get used in a way to um, as a policing mechanism to pick us up to prevent us from a perceived idea of something. And we know that this um, occurs because there was a was a situation where uh, well, yeah, anyway I I have experience of that through friends. Um, also, the fifth element in the um, from Brown versus Tasmania, the princi fifth principle, is that the breadth and vagueness of terms should not interfere with the implied freedom of communication. And my concern with the Bail as Act is that there's four terms that I think are extremely broadly able to be defined by the court. Uh, one is commit an offence, which it just seems to be extraordinary because everybody. You know, does that mean going through a stop sign? Does that mean parking in the wrong place? Does that mean, um, you know, littering, as the friend said? It so, could be, but in this context, it's committing an offence of a similar nature, as I understand. It's not explicit, though. Well, that's how I understand it. The nature of the offence, um, in this case, I would say the nature of the offence, these are political offences, and they are not... Um, Willful damage is not a political offence. They admit that I didn't do any. It is not submit. It is submitted that the applicant person that the applicant person committed any property damage or violence. It is not submitted that the applicant personally committed any property damage or violence, with the exception of the alleged common assault, which is ten people walking through a door at the same time, and which they had organised that woman to pinpoint me in order to get the, the warrant. 
Yes. Right. So I have not committed willful damage. I've never committed willful damage. What about enter premises with intent? To commit willful damage. That I, we are pleading not guilty to that. We have been advised that we have um, a defence. Because what we did, the damage, what the damage was, was people pasting some pieces of paper on yes. a glass cabinet was the damage. Okay, and that would have been cleaned off with a, a, a sponge. Uh, and so that's the actual willful damage. It's not like we went in there with sticks to blah, 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 blah. blah. No, no, but all of, all of these things were no doubt taken into account by the court when granting you bail because that's, that was the test in determining whether you were an unacceptable risk or not and the court satisfied that you weren't with the imposition of this condition. Potentially, I was in front of um, Magistrate... I mean, Magistrate Merrin did not hear it because she said she would not undermine the other magistrate. Well, what, what she said was that she wasn't satisfied there was a material change of circumstances. Correct. So which she was necessary to demonstrate if you wanted to make a further application to bail. That's right. She didn't... And I asked her, should I take that to the Supreme Court? She said, you can't. I, 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 let's talk about Magistrate Power and the situation on Magistrate Power. I had no problem with Magistrate Power, I think. The, the, um, but the issue was I had been in the watch house for two days after being picked up in my bed at 6.30 in the morning the day before. I had two days with no pen, no paper, no access Ms. to Ms. papers. Ms Pistorius, it, these matters don't bear upon your application for the variation. You asked about... That the, the previous taking into account these these elements, I'm saying no, they couldn't have because they didn't have them in front. It, of it doesn't matter for, for whatever's happened in the previous applications. You you have an application now to okay. vary the conditions. So I'm looking at. I'm only raising it because you raised it. I'm, I no, I'm I'm raising with you, directing you to what's important on this application that you need to address, mm -hmm. and that is, again, what you say about the necessity of this condition whether it's too onerous or not? Well, I say there is no necessity for this condition and that the necessity is, is based on... Um, <laughs> is, ..is based on sort of some sort of false allegations um, and that, that it's disproportionate because it's a political matter, that the political matter um, uh, has... ..and the... And the uh, those principles of Brown versus Tasmania, they have a, a precedence in the decision making over whether or not I may or may not offend again, and that the idea of me offending again is um, a very spurious and um, unclear idea, um, because I have been an activist for a very long time, and from time to time. I find a point at which it's important to give a clear message about things. I'm not pretending in any way that I'm going to draw back from being an activist. My concern is about the deterrence element in, this, in these bail conditions that stop me from supporting others, standing with others, continuing to act in those spaces, um, able to hand out leaflets in the front of Boeing, able to put up a, a flag at the front of Ferra. And in fact, you know, the police say I was going back to whip up violence. What I had been going to do was go back and hand out leaflets in the neighbourhood um, and take my banners and put my banners up. That's the actual reality of most of what I do. Um, and sometimes we do move into Occupy spaces because location-based work is part of what we do. We're in a very dire situation and it's very hard to counter um, the multi-millionaires who, who drive... MSN and the mainstream media. So we are trying to, as ordinary citizens, um, find a space to take our duty in relationship to the implied freedom of communication. Um, and that is the Im important thing for us. But the secondary important thing is us. I do, want to, do not want to get locked up. I do want to get arbitrarily locked up by the police because I have a couple of tiny little bail conditions and they use them in some way because they think or imagine that I'm going to do something because that is the way bail is being used as a policing um, um, mechanism. And I would say that that use of bail uh, as a policing me mechanism against protesters or against ordinary citizens goes is an is a undermining of the Bail Act. It's an improper use of the Bail Act. And um, 
the offences that we commit are not um, uh, the same offences. They're not violent offences. They're not escalating offences. They're not um, harm. They're not harmful of human beings. In fact, what they're doing, trying to do, is to shut down the harm against human beings. Well, there is there is an allegation of common assault. There is, and I've explained that what that is is a. 10 people moving through a doorway that's 90 centimetres wide and the police um, investigating in such a way that they pin that moving through the door on me um, in order to make sure that they have at least one indictable offence there to enable a, a search of my house at 6.30 in the morning and a raid on my house with uh, six counterterrorism officers. It's it totally sort of made up as a, uh, as a methodology to enable them to raid uh, a share house of elderly women at 6.30 in the morning. Ms Pistorius, I think I understand the basis for your application. Is there anything further in particular that you want to take me to? Um, no, I reckon... I just, Oh, okay, one, just one other point which I haven't touched on, which is they do, they use, the police use it to withdraw our liberty. They, put, they throw us, they put us, they incarcerate us um, on a whim because they think something's going to happen. And I just want to say on top of that is that we very, very rarely get jailed, jail sentences. So every time they do that, they are, um, you know, they're, they're punishing us in advance because... Truth is, we almost never get jail sentences for these very low-level offending offences. Um, maybe after five years of doing it once a month, we get jail sentences. But that is not the situation that you're looking at me and I've, you know, that's not what you're seeing here. Yes, thank you, Ms. Pistorius. Mr Knight. <coughs> thank you, Your Honour. Um, the test that you're has to apply in this application, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is a relatively narrow one. It's whether the conditions in, the circum in all the circumstances are more onerous than is necessary. Uh, there's been some discussion in terms of what the word necessary means. In my submission, in this context, it's simply uh, whether it's necessary to uh, ameliorate the risks, the relevant risks, to an acceptable level. Uh, in this matter, the relevant risk is that of re-offending. Um, it's not specified to offences of violence or property damage or any specific offences, offences generally. Um, while there may be political motivations for the offences, the, the reality is that she's been charged with, offending, with offences as a result of this uh, activity in the premises of the relevant businesses. Um, the condition that she not go within 50 metres of those businesses uh, is only said to be too onerous uh, in terms of uh, that it would prohibit uh, the applicant from attending further protests. Um, if those further protests are needed to be within more than 50, or less than 50 feet of those businesses, uh, there is uh, the foreseeable risk that further offences of, of the same nature may be committed. Uh, and in those circumstances, um, it's submitted um, on behalf of the Crown that the conditions are not too onerous in the circumstances. Unless I can assist you on it further. What do you say about the basis? What's the basis for saying that the risk of, there's a foreseeable risk that offences of the same nature may be committed by the applicant? The applicant has a relevant criminal history for offences of this nature. She has a criminal history in Queensland, New South, uh, Perth, New South Wales, um, Victoria, the Northern Territory, and there's also an entry on her uh, Australian, federal, Australian Federal Police history. So there is a uh, form for this kind of uh, offending and the fact that the, uh, the only submission with respect to uh, how the condition is onerous is simply so that she can return to this kind of, uh, these kind of protests um, would give the inference that those sort of offences are reasonably foreseeable in the circumstances. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pistori. Is there anything you want to say in response to those submissions? I want to say that as a citizen who's conducted, uh, since I was about 25, 
I think I've got 16 offences in 29 years. Uh, it's not even one a year. Um, I think that what happens as you get older, you get a file that's longer, that's higher, not because I'm becoming a more criminal person, even if that is a thing, which I'm not sure it is. It's because I'm becoming a clearer and more conscientious person. And if you go through your life without having stood up against what is clearly a genocide, then you are standing with the genocide. As a DPP, you will be standing with the genocide. And I, I would say that there's been a role for civil resistance in our society for all time. And that whether I am committing an offence or not is not relevant. Yes, thank you.
applicant, Margaret Cecilia Pistorius, seeks a variation of bail. She was granted bail initially on the 21st, 24th of January 2024 in relation to offences of unlawful assembly into premises with intent, common assault and contravening an order about information necessary to access information stored electronically. <clears throat> Those offences arose out of alleged incidents which are said to have occurred during protests at the business addresses of two businesses, one being Boeing Defence and the other the Ferra Group. <clears throat> when granted bail, a condition was imposed that the applicant <clears throat> not go within 50 metres of each of those business premises. The applicant now seeks removal of those conditions. <clears throat> the particular condition is condition number four of the undertaking which states you must not go within 50 metres of 150 Charlotte Street, Brisbane City unless attending a police station and you must not go within 50 metres of 344 New Cleveland Road, Tingalpa at any time. Those being the two locations of Boeing and Ferra Group. charge of contravening an order about information necessary to access information stored electronically is listed for hearing in the Holland Park Magistrates Court on the 29th of May 2024 and the other charges are next for mention on the 27th of March 2024 in the Brisbane Magistrates Court. The alleged facts of the matter are set out in the police bail affidavit which is produced in the material that Ms Pistorius relies upon. It's also summarised in the Crown's outline. The relevant facts are that on the 8th of January 2024, police responded to a triple O call in relation to protest activity at the business address of Ferret and Tingalpa. It said there were about 20 to 30 protesters present who allegedly entered the company's secure warehouse, damaged property and assaulted workers. The protest was organised in relation to the alleged supply of weapons by the company to Israel for use in the ongoing conflict in Gaza. It is not alleged that the applicant personally assaulted any person or damaged any property, although it is said that it's suspected that she organised the protest and was involved in the planning and motivation of the protest. I note in the police objection affidavit, it is said that the applicant was observed actively participating in the protest activity within the building premises, but is not alleged to have assaulted any person or damaged any property during the incident. The other incident that is alleged is on the 17th of January 2024. Police were called to a pro-Palestine protest at the business address of Boeing Defence in Charlotte Street in the city. At about 11 a.m. that day, a group of protesters accessed the business premises by going up the lift of the building. They were initially unable to access entry to the building due to the door being locked. One of the protesters told the receptionist that she required access to speak to her father while the others hid down an adjacent walkway. Once the door was opened, the protest group entered the foyer. It's alleged that the applicant drove her shoulder into the receptionist's chest and prevented from closing the door. That forms the basis of the common assault charge and the entry premises with intent. Once inside the building or the office, it's alleged that the group of protesters then placed about 40 to 50 stickers on a glass cabinet window, which were then brushed over with a glue-type substance that required specialised cleaning equipment to remove them. The building and lift were locked down and said there was an impact on other businesses in the building for about an hour. In that incident, the affidavit objecting to bail by police <clears throat> further 
elaborated, stating that one of the protesters pretended that she needed to speak to her father and convinced the receptionist to open the door to confirm details. Once the door was opened, that person and the defendant forced their way past the receptionist. The receptionist claimed that the defendant drove her shoulder into her chest, preventing the receptionist from closing the door. That's the common assault allegation. Again, It is not submitted that the applicant personally committed any property damage or violence with the exception of that common assault allegation at the Boeing office. But it is alleged that she was involved in participating in each incident. <clears throat> the original condition that was imposed prohibiting the applicant from going within 50 metres of the two office locations was imposed as it was considered necessary to ensure that the applicant was not at an unacceptable risk of committing further offences if granted bail. The applicant seeks the removal of that condition in whole. She submits that it is not a necessary condition. She further submits that the bail condition having been imposed and the allegations are premised on false allegations and really motivated by police attitudes towards the protest actions that were engaged in. She has emphasised the rightful and lawful ability for persons to engage in political activities and peaceful protest activities and public assemblies and that those are organised activities which are protected under the law are not unlawful under any law in this country and as well are recognised by international forums and instruments as being fundamental human rights. The applicant further submits that in this case, the police are really using the bail conditions to preemptively control her ability to engage in protest activities and that they are not legitimately seeking to employ the Bail Act. <coughs> she further submits that what is being done is in effect that she has been charged with matters she was for a period of time detained in the watch house. She submits that this is really a withdrawal of her liberty and particularly in circumstances where it's unlikely that in respect of the offences that are alleged that she would be sentenced to any jail time in the event of any conviction. The police are really using the Bail Act and the charging process as a way of deterring her and other persons from engaging in legitimate protest activities. She further submits that she has a long history of non-violent protesting, that she has for many years participated in protest activities, particularly in circumstances where she has attended on-site which is a form of protest which she submits is often more effective. And she submits that the condition that has been imposed is one which really impinges upon and prevents her ability to engage in political communications. And she invokes the implied freedom of political communication concept in that regard and submits that the condition here does prohibit and prevent her from engaging in what would otherwise be her lawful and rightful ability to not only protest but communicate political issues to a wider audience. Crown opposes the application for variation. Crown submits that 
whilst the context of engaging in peaceful protest is not unlawful. <clears throat> Here in this case, it has gone beyond that. The applicant is charged with committing offences and the condition that was imposed was sufficient and necessary to ensure that she would not be an unacceptable risk of committing further offences of a similar nature if granted bail. The applicant does have prior convictions in Queensland and other jurisdictions. They include offences that have been linked to engaging in protest activities elsewhere, such as pre uh, trespass and entering particular locations or premises without authority and public nuisance offences. The applicant has indicated and, and submitted in her material and in her oral submissions that she is of the view that she has a duty to engage in protest activities, particularly in the context of the ongoing conflict in Gaza, to bring awareness to the issues and the injustices involved in organisations such as Boeing and Ferra, that were the target of the protests in this case, being complicit and involved in ongoing genocide and atrocities in Gaza. <coughs> Having regard to the reasons for the proposed variation which is sought on the material before me, I'm not satisfied it's appropriate to vary the conditions as sought. I do not consider that the condition that currently exists prohibiting the applicant from going within 50 metres of the identified locations is more onerous than is necessary, having regard to the nature of the offences with which she's charged, her personal circumstances and the public interest. It does seem to me that the applicant is clearly motivated to engage in further protest activities. There is no prohibition on her doing so. What has been imposed by way of condition is a small limitation that she not go within 50 metres of those locations and that is evidently imposed to ensure that she does not unlawfully enter buildings or business premises in a similar way to that which is alleged in respect of the offences with which she is charged. I do not consider that the condition is more onerous than necessary. It's not disproportionate, in my view, to any capacity or ability of the applicant to engage further in peaceful and lawful protest activities. But I do consider that there is a risk of repetition of similar offences without the condition remaining. So for those reasons, the application is refused. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you.